welcome everyone. Thank you guys for coming to Outside the Lines Live Coloring Night. This is our first one for 2022. If you're new here, um, I, I, this is presented by Abrams Engel Institute for the Visual Arts in conjunction with Art Play. Ava is a visual arts center located on campus of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. We present eight to 10 exhibitions per year, highlighting a mix of regionally, nationally, and internationally acclaimed artists focused almost exclusively on contemporary art. We serve a diverse audience of university faculty, staff, and students, but also artists, museum patrons, and donors. We help represent the visual arts to UAB, uh, the local and regional uh, communities, um, and then we also serve nationally international art community while simultaneously striving to keep our exhibitions directly relevant and engaging to our surrounding Birmingham communities. Since opening in 2014, Ava has been featured in publications such as the New York Times, the Huffington Post, the Nation, Raw Vision Magazine, PBS Canvas, and we are very proud that our exhibitions and related educational programming are free and open to the public. Um, so this is a series of events that we do once a month, uh, first Thursday of not every month, but almost every month uh, in our main fall and spring semesters. Uh, and it's actually the brainchild of our Student Arts Council. So hello to any students there. Um, we are actually joined by one of our Student Arts Council members, Disney Bagwell, who's going to wave her hand. Uh, if you have any questions, please be sure to drop those into the chat and Disney will ask those as we go on. Um, before I get started, a few quick housekeeping notes. Um, please note the, that discriminatory or hate language of any kind will not be tolerated. This session is being recorded, but no, the recordings are largely the screen shares. So we want you to, we want to encourage you, if you feel comfortable with it, turn on your screens. This is a night to decompress, color, and participate in a discussion about art. Um, so tonight is our first coloring night of the semester. Uh, it, we are kicking it off with William Downs. He is one of our exhibiting artists for this semester. And um, just a quick note, if you are in town, uh, we are open 12 to 5, Tuesday through Saturday, and you're welcome to come by and see his exhibition, as well as the 46th Annual Juried Student Exhibition with the Department of Art and Art Hi History, for which William is, uh, is the juror for this semester as well. And then we have two other exhibitions, Lily Reeves and Sonia Young-James. So um, really great work, all of them up until March 19th. And then if you really enjoyed tonight's event, join us again on March 3rd uh, with artist Dan Bynum. And then on April 7th, we will be joined by the graduating seniors of the Bachelor of Fine Arts exhibition. So now on to the main event. Um, welcome, William. I'm going to introduce you and, uh, and then we will get started talking about your artwork. So William Downs currently lives and works in Atlanta. He earned his MFA from the Mount Royal School of Art at the Maryland Institute College of Art and his BFA in painting and printmaking from the Atlanta College of Art and Design. His work has been exhibited in both solo and group exhibitions around the U.S. and internationally, including Ava Cimento Gallery in L.A., Contemporary Art Museum, and the uh, Century Gallery in London, International Print Center New York, the Contemporary Art Museum at the University of South Florida, the African American Museum in Philadelphia, the, the Derek Eller Gallery in New York, and in 2018, he received the Artadia Award and a Nellie May Rowe Fellowship at the Hambridge, sorry, Hambridge Creative Residency Center Program, and was also a visiting artist uh, sorry, visiting critic at Anderson Ranch in Colorado this past fall. Uh, quite a list of, you're very busy as we were talking earlier. So welcome. Thank you so, so much for being here um, and being with us tonight. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we have all of, if you're interested, here's all of his, um, to follow him on Instagram and also his galleries. But I'm just going to click through our slides and let's get started. and. Uh, Welcome. How did you decide to get into art? Um, hi, hello. Um, I decided early on that that I felt like I needed something that I could control. I was a runner. I played basketball. I played um, what else? Um, played a lot of sports, and I felt like. The thing about sports is you have to share it with everybody. 
and I felt like making art was something that I could control myself and make my own worlds and find my way through the world through art. So I maintained a strict, um, I guess I took all the right art classes. I went to art magnet school, went to art college, and I just felt like that was my world and I needed to stick with it. A lot of my friends were musicians um, in high school and I, I knew I couldn't play any music. So art was something that I felt like could be parallel to that. And I always tried to figure out how to create the same sound in my work that music made people feel or um, that I wanted it to feel like. So that's kind of how I decided to stay with art. That's awesome. Um, so what is your favorite medium and why? Like, what were you into maybe in high school? And then how did you end up where you're at now? Sorry, that's like two questions. Let's go with the favorite medium first. <laughs> well, I can wrap it all up into one, which is... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so my favorite medium is drawing. And when I figured out painting was something that was um, pretty advanced when I was in high school. I was, I thought I was going to be a painter for the rest of my life. Um, and then I ran into printmaking and I love printmaking. I think it's really beautiful. I taught printmaking for a second. Um, but drawing is the most important part for me. I feel like it's the, the, it's the, it's like the structure or it's like the skeleton. It's like the foundation. It's where so many mistakes could happen and you can still keep going. Um, so drawing is my favorite thing. You can draw with anything. Um, drawings can do whatever you want them to. So I feel like drawing is something that um, I'm glad that I kept on my, in my toolbox, so to speak. And so um, with that, can you uh, talk about, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your process then? So I know we've got, uh, talk to us about your process. I keep skipping ahead. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so my process is a couple things. Um, graphite drawing starts everything. And then I use a process called ink wash which is ink and water. Um, I used to be more mixed media with the image that we're looking at right now is a combination of ink wash and Conte crayon and chalk. Um, I feel that color is something that I see all the time and working in black and white gives me that opportunity to challenge the viewers um, um, feelings about color because you have to match it up instead of having the, the responsibility already in front of you. So black and white is what I feel is more important to me right now. But I like that it's so bare minimal. Um, it's just water and ink, and you can create a whole gradation of color and value through that, which is very hard to do because the water controls everything. And I, I like to have something that um, keeps me on my toes. So this medium, you never know if you're going to lose it or if you're going to gain something, you're going to find something. So for me, I like having the surprises and I don't edit. So a lot of the mistakes stay on the canvas or the wall or paper. And it's very fluid. And I feel like my figures are very fluid. So the ink keeps that whimsical line, um, the energy I use brushes in a way that you shouldn't use them. Like I use like, maybe two or three brushes at a time sometimes to create a different line. So I like it because I have fun in it. And a lot of these drawings show that there's like a lot of activity happening, some spontaneity is there. Um, a lot of the water creates a really beautiful um, atmospheric quality when you put spray paint over it or if you add more ink to it. it disperses in a way that you can't control. So I, I love that. Can you tell us a little bit more about these? I think this is one of the pieces that's actually up on display at Ava. Um, where, how do you get to these images and why do you decide on these kind of seemingly androgynous 
type figures? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think, I think my attention span for the way that portrait art and, and work that's about the figure, it sometimes has a lot of weight that makes me feel um, that there's a responsibility that I don't want to really partake in sometimes. And I feel like sometimes the figure can be um, addressed in a way where it can bore you in a way. So for me, I taught life drawing for a long time and I think about how building the body is so important to people. But for me, destructing the body and creating a new body is it's very important. And the ambiguous parts to me are letting people put their own attachments to it. So if I give them an empty slate or empty frame, you can put your own on top of it. So the two drawings that are at um, UAB, they speak about, um, this one is called The Conversation. It's about something dramatic that's happening. Everybody's tense. Everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. So like if I were a writer, this would be a short story about something that's happening. And there's the protagonist, there's the, the person who's controlling the conversation. So there are all these characters to me that fit a short story. Um, and I think that the more and more I work this way, the more and more my stories are becoming more um, animated with a lot of figures that are like, not stagnant, like something's really happening. So the titles kind of give that small slice of um, information about what's happening. Um, the other one, which is called They Were Born in the Desert, it's um, about my love for cactus. And yeah, that's the one. In the middle part of the figure that's on the bottom of the frame, that's my pet cactus. His name is Jeffrey. Um, so Jeffrey's appeared in a lot of my wall drawings and um, sometimes in the distance, but now Jeffrey's becoming a main character in a lot of the new work. But I find this love for the desert, um, mostly because of the sky and the way that the, the earth is shaped in the desert, it appeals to me. I grew up in the country. I grew up around lush mountains and countryside. So South Carolina. So going to the desert was like going to another planet for me. And that's where I drew a lot of the inspiration for a lot of this work, which um, happened in the last four years. So a lot of it's still fresh and I'm still learning about it, which is great because I feel like um, once you learn about something, you want to move on to something else. So for me, it's educating me daily and weekly. So I'm really excited about making these black and white, big works on campus. So we have two questions in the chat right now. Um, okay. The first one is, it says, what is the meaning of the clothing that seems to be prickly or almost like barbed wire? Yes, the clothing is... Um, it's kind of like this connection to um, the cactus. So they're cactus suits. Um, for me, I'm thinking about that as a way of protecting the body. It's not a, um, it's not prickling. It's not hurting anyone. If you look at all their faces, no one's um, feeling um, anything distraught. They're all calm and cool. So it's this really beautiful, um, fabric that covers the body, kind of like wool in a way. That's what I'm thinking. But I think about how certain animals have um, um, thorns like porcupines and um, what else? There's a few other animals that have thorns that protect them. Roses pr have thorns to protect them. So that's kind of my whole idea of this cactus seat. Can I, can I piggyback off that then um, and ask, uh, before you move on to your next question, Disney, um, is, oh, well, and I just may have forgotten what I was about to ask. Um, 
what is it intending to protect them from? And is that a, is, is that a theme that starts to kind of go through particularly your more recent work? So um, there's always this conversation about the nude body in all works. Everybody's afraid of the body. Everybody has their opinion about the body. We're screaming about, about the body now. Um, we're always affected by the body. So for me, having this beautiful, dramatic um, outfit that covers the body is a way of kind of repelling that and kind of giving the subject something else, kind of diverging into this way of thinking about, oh, this is a weird covering of the body, but what does that mean? So it opens up questions, and I, I like that. And then graphically, it looks like it's making a sound because the direction of the thorns are following the sounds that I'm listening to in my studio. So if I'm listening to something um, really heavy or fast or slow, the thorns kind of move that way. And when you look at a lot of them in a room, you can almost hear the sound that's happening. So that's kind of my way of kind of using the, the covering of the body as a way of avoiding any kind of um, conversation about gender and um, sexuality. I want it to be universal. And I just want people to feel um, comfortable about the figure, but if they feel uncomfortable because of the thorns, that's fine too, because that's a conversation that we can have. And as you see, there's no penetration, there's no blood, so it's not harming them. Um, so I, I love that that's a concern for some people sometimes. All right, Disney, did you want to ask your next question? Yes. So our second question is, have you always painted on large canvases or how did these large canvases come about? Um, yes and no. I started with small works um, throughout time because of studio spaces and moving around. Everything was really small. For a couple of years, I commuted from New York to Baltimore. I was teaching at the Maryland Institute College of Art. So my studio was in the cafe car where the table was used as my studio. So everything had to be small. And during those years, I was showing all over the place. So I had to make things that were, you know, able to ship easy, but easy for me to work because I would work three hours to Baltimore and then sometimes three hours back to New York. So that was a period where everything was really small. So when I started working on the wall, that's when everything changed. Um, my first show, I made a drawing that was six by six, six feet by six feet. It was a show of, I think, 13 artists. Each one had a six by six foot square and we had to draw directly on the wall. And that was the first moment where I was like, wait a minute, I need to do something with this after the show happened. So from there, I started um, making larger works and um, that was like 2017 or 16. And that's how it's been ever since. And this is a detail on how I start the drawings. There's a really light line that I start with and then the ink just follows and finishes everything. So you have um, a lot of a lot of things kind of going on in your uh, in your works. Do you uh, again, I'm, I'm trying to add in two questions because I, I wanted to take this in a different direction, but I guess first question. You also do mural type um, installations at, in addition to the large canvases like we have over at Ava. Um, are, but also sometimes it seems like you have a scene going on in the middle, but then you've got a scene kind of going up on the left. And, you know, how do you compose these? Are, is it meant to be a story, like one large story? Or um, do you have smaller stories going in, on in there? And then are do you prefer to really do murals versus 
canvas? So several questions at once. Yeah. Um, simple answer, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so yes, I want to do murals all the time because I love the idea that you can create so much drama, so much um, information into a large composition. It all started for me when I fell in love with cave drawings and when I researched on how the cave was the information for the cavemen. And when you go through a cave, there are these moments where it talks about food, it talks about water, it talks about life, it talks about the gatherings, it talks about everything in the territories. So for me, that kind of hit me when I started making my murals, where I wanted to have these sections that kind of gave the viewer these opportunities to experience um, what's going on. And some of these stories are, they're personal, but they're not my personal. They're kind of a universal personal. So I'm thinking about how we're affected by life and how you can see something that happens in a drawing that really didn't happen in real life, but you're not um, affected by it like you would if you're looking at YouTube, but you're more admiring that there's this longer epic story that's happening. And that's what the wall drawings do for me. The canvases um, are the records of a lot of these things that you can keep. And the reason why I say that is because my murals, I show up at the beginning, I make them, and then at the end of the exhibition, I show up and I paint over them. So a lot of them disappear. And it's very intense because some people who visit the spaces or work at the gallery museum are experiencing that for a month and then it goes away. And there's no record other than a photograph. So my friend Scott Ingram was kind of, <laughs> he was a little, um, he was a little sad about it, and he was like, yo, man, I'm going to help you keep these big things by organizing a show, and we're going to make a room that's 100 feet by 100 feet, and it's going to be all canvas, and that's going to be a beautiful way of keeping one of your wall drawings. So after that, I started working mostly on canvas so that we could keep these records so my show at Derek Eller, this is probably the first show of the large works in canvas all together. And um, I felt like I, at this point in my life, I'm thinking about the future of the life of the work and it's about the monumentalness. Um, I want to be remembered. I want to be a part of the black American artist of our time with these black and white drawings. So. That's why they're important to me, and that's why they're so large in scale. And I want to keep these records of time as a part of what's happening. So a lot of these drawings that you're looking at, they all kind of talk about what was going on in COVID or how people couldn't gather, but they're all about gathering. And they're all about spirituality. There's this black looming figure that hovers and protects and keeps everything balanced um, so I think I answered your question plus <laughs> yes yeah no that's um it, it inspired another kind of question to kind of go off of that so you talk about trying to keep a record and then this almost kind of speaking to a broader human experience um what do you feel is the kind of main thing that you're trying to record and do you have like an almost like an advocacy element to any of this like what what is kind of is there a central core thing that you know you keep coming back to when you're thinking about it um or yeah wherever you want to take that <laughs> so i grew up uh, with um <laughs> uncles and a father who all had great stories to tell we'd be on a road trip and my dad would tell us one of the most amazing stories that happened to him as a kid. But I mean, we would be listening to the radio, but his story would be more exciting because of the way that his delivery, his 
way of talking about the different characters and the different people. For, so for me, growing up with that kind of audio um, narrative and then meeting the people that he was talking about, me and my brother were shocked. We were like, oh, that guy with the short leg, that's him. Or the guy with the one arm who was a mechanic. We met him and we were like, whoa, we thought our dad was just making this shit up. So, <laughs> so for me, that was like, I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be able to be able to control a room of um, humans with a story. And that's what he would do. And that's what my uncles would do. They could keep everybody on their toes with a great story. So for me, I'm trying to translate that into my weird narratives and I'm using the body, yoga, spirituality, gatherings, um, contortion. To me, that, those things express a lot of things that humans do. And so like this show at Grizzly Grizzly, I want this to be a big gathering of bodies that are kind of embracing and um, they're in different perspectives of the landscape. But the stories are kind of one by one, but they all make up a big story at the same time. So I want to be a storyteller. Um, and I think with pictures, it's a great way to hold audience and to give people a chance to be a part of that. So we have another question in the chat. Um, it says, do the shadow figures always mean the same thing like you explained as a facilitator or peacemaker? Or does the meaning change with each work? That's a great question. Um, I think a lot about that. And you're right. It does change because sometimes the figure, the black figure, is um, holding everything. And then sometimes the black figure is just cutting through the landscape and then sometimes the black figure is looming so they're all different responsibilities and for me visually when i'm making the composition i'm thinking about balance rhythm and movement so the black figure sometimes helps with keeping everything kind of together like if you look at an mc escher drawing or print there's always this balance that's happening so the black figure is the balancer in all of my compositions and whether its responsibility is negative or positive is always controlling and supporting. What about the other motifs that uh, pop up in your artwork? So the eyes is something that you see repeated a lot, the kind of blurred or looking multiple ways face. Um, what uh and also are there any other themes that really pop up a lot yeah there's usually a guy on his iphone that's suspended or sitting on somebody or just observing that's the person who kind of reflects the observer in different conversations or the person who's not participating in a conversation or the person who's always distracted by their iphone so in the conversation there's always the loud person who's controlling the room, and then the quiet person who's controlling the room. So there's that balance, again, of these two um, support systems or these conversations. Um, there's always a handstander because the hands are trying their way to get closer to the earth, and the feet are trying their way to get to the sky. And then there's always um, the, the person who is... Um, I call it the androgynous alien, and it's the one that doesn't have a face or an expression, but it just has a body. So those are my usual go-tos because I feel like they add more drama to my compositions. And um, there's always someone just kind of in the distance doing nothing. <laughs> and when I fell in love with Hieronymus Bosch years ago, I always wanted to create scenes like his scenes where there's always this activity that's happening in the composition and you really don't know what they're, they're doing. But when you look at the whole, there's this underground theme that happens and that's what I want my big drawings to do. Like here, these are the 
the two internet lovers and the internet are the black figures looming over them, watching them search on their um, Google. And then that's the guy sitting up there. He's on his iPhone, just not being part of the conversation. And the one on the right, that's the androgynous alien with the face that's not really there. But the multiple faces come from having to deal with a lot of things. We're always looking around. We're always searching. We're always working. We're always dealing with a lot of different personalities. So for me, that's kind of like this dizziness that's happening. We're always on the go. So the gesture is this figure that's always moving. And then there's always the two-headed figure who's looking forward and looking backwards. And usually that person's the one that's thinking about the past, present, and future. So I'm trying to wrap all of those things into one package. <laughs> it's a lot like our normal conversations. Like there's always that one person that's looking for, you know, we wanted to go to this restaurant because that person might be there or, um, but they didn't tell the group that. So they're just looking to, to see or, um, you know, waiting for something else to happen or they want to be somewhere else. And so there's always, we have so much going on today. Yes. Um, I think it, I, I, to go back kind of to earlier, I feel like the um, not having too much color in your artwork really helps draw that into focus a little yes. bit. Yes, exactly. With too much color, you're just like, whoa, at least my eyes are. It's like too much, too much. But um, I have made a mural or two that are full of color, and I kind of made it more uh, monochromatic so that you wouldn't be blinded by all of the colors that these black and white um, drawings would make. We have another question and Sorry. it says, are the stories you create for the figures in your work based on personal experiences? Yes, but not usually mine. <laughs> like a storyteller, I love it when people tell me stories because those stories get put in compartments in my brain and then they come out on the canvas. So I, I love um, listening to people um, either um, on podcasts or just friends who want to vent their stories to me. I listen very deeply and then it might show up on the wall or canvas. <laughs> <laughs> so outside of people's uh, stories and maybe your own, what else influences your work? Um, music is very strong. Um, a lot of the music that I listen to are singer-songwriters who are very um, graphic in their narratives. And some are stripped down with like just guitar or a big band. Um, I'm really obsessed right now with Thundercat. Um, he's like, kind of like my theme right now. He's just having fun and it's just bass, drums, and then another musician playing whatever instrument that he's bringing in to kind of go with those two instruments. Um, Bill Callahan is another person that I'm really excited about. I love his voice. I love his, um, rawness, his bareness. Um, I think I relate to him a lot because I have a deep voice. And whenever I talk, I'm always conscious of it. That's why I have a fear of microphones. So whenever I'm going to give a lecture or whatever, I'm so excited to do it. But once I hear my voice, I get a little insecure. So <laughs> I love people like um, Bill Callahan and Isaac Hayes and people that have these deep voices but can sing really well. And then there's this guy named Will Oldham who is out of Kentucky. He's amazing. He's a very good writer. So his songs to me kind of sing what my drawings are wanting to sing. So I always have him um, playing. Neil Young is another person that's always there. I love his album On the Beach. Um, that album has made so many drawings for me, which I really do love. PJ Harvey is another a musician that I keep all the time on rotation. She's just epic in her sound and her delivery. Her story is also really beautiful and narrative. Um, I'm also 
excited about um, Big Thief right now. They're just such a great band. Like the way that they can take you from melancholy to excitement. Um, I I want my work to do that, so I'm always studying them. And then Tyler, the creator, he's like who I want to be. He's like my dream musician. And then the last person who's like the epic star of it all is Prince. He's like the genius of time. And I love how his way of being ambiguous kind of created his whole mystique of his whole music world and how he was so diverse. So music in a long way is everything that supports my drawings. It's almost as if sometimes the figures are dancing through your drawings. Yes. Are you dancing while you make your artwork? <laughs> <laughs> I do headstands every now and then. Um, <laughs> but I think um, my hands do all the dancing. Like, mm -hmm. all the dancing is right here because I'm trying to, like, move the lines across the surface to create that kind of dance. Um, I love it when people dance into my studio when I'm working because they like the song that I'm playing. And when they're dancing, I'm trying to get that feeling. So... Um, yeah, but um, the big guys who are cutting through, those guys are, um, they reminisce Michael Jordan, and Michael Jordan is one of my heroes, and, and I think a lot about how he flies through the sky, or flies through the air, and how his body stretches across the basketball court. So that's what a lot of these guys are mimicking, is his body. So. Not dancing, but mostly basketball cutting through. But also the power and influence of that um, stance for a yep. lot of kids that particularly grew up watching him and then movies. And then I, I would love to think that Space Jam has its own life <laughs> if that <laughs> continues on. So they, people are still um, into him, uh, even if they didn't grow up watching him live. But right. um yeah, th there's almost like a power to these particular yes. figures as yeah. well. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, not directly about your art, but kind of a little bit more because this was a um, an event created by students for students originally at the beginning. Um, I always want to make sure I ask some questions that I know they are always asking of artists. So the first thing is, um, were you how did you know that you wanted to uh, pursue like first off major in art and then pursue that MFA and become a professional artist? Um, I think both my parents kind of gave me and my brother this kind of vision of you have to think about what you're going to do for your future. And with that, I had to decide early, like I knew that after high school, college was my option. I didn't want to stay at home and work in a factory and just work nine to five because I had too much um, in me to give. And art was the way that I gave. So I thought I had to set up my system. So I had to create a game plan. And with that game plan, I've talked to over and over with my dad all the time. And it was kind of like a game of chess. We talked about, okay, if you do this and you do this, you can do that. So having two parents that were really obsessed with what we were going to do later on in our life kind of helped me, kind of guide my way. And once I started to see that my work was really um, moving, I sold my first piece when I was in high school in a local gallery in Greenville. That was like the green light. Once that happened, I knew that I had to go to college for it to really push it and see how far I could take it. And within that, going to the Atlanta College of Art was the opening of my future in my life because that school was so great. Um, it was a small school at the time. It was like 400 students when I got there. And I was friends with half, half of them. So that community really did spark my um, foundation because everybody wanted to be an artist. Everybody wanted to be in art history. Everybody had that goal and that drive. So I was a part of this whole system of people that were hungry. And 
with that having shows and making a little bit of money like i wanted all that stuff and then i started thinking about oh i want to be in art history i want to be in you know the black american the you know, african american museum like i had all these goals and with that that helped me pursue um my mfa to help me like really build my foundation even more and to prolong my education and give me all of the stamps of approval. And I knew that all of this wasn't going to be easy, but I was ready. Like I was working my bottom off to make sure that everything was um, ready for all of these different phases of my life. So once I got into the Maryland Institute College of Art, I knew that that was going to be the turning point of what's going to happen to my future. Am I going to be a professor or a, I was just going to keep going to New York and show and galleries. But I thought teaching would be the phase that would help me um, help other people figure out their pathways. So that's kind of how I did it. Does teaching or um, I, a lot of artists have to have before they can really make this their full-time job, a lot of other side gigs and um, you know, do what kind of side gigs out, outside of teaching have you had and uh, had those influenced um, your art or your practice in any way? Yes. Um, <laughs> so my side gigs are art shipping and art preparatory work. And believe it or not, I was a bicycle messenger for a long time. And that was the best job that I've ever had because I had so much freedom. I could make drawings all day. I made money on my bicycle. It was dangerous. I had friends who were dangerous. Um, <laughs> it was such a great lifestyle. And I still am friends with a lot of the bike messengers who um, I met in Baltimore, New York, San Francisco, um, Atlanta. Um, Chicago, Boston. So being a messenger kind of helped me to be more of an art shipper because you're carrying something that's very valuable and you need to protect it. So my dream, I guess, at some point um, is to open up my own shipping company of some sort. So that's a goal down the road. Um, I love working with friends who have their own shipping companies right now because um, I think about how it would be with Downs Shipping Company. So <laughs> those are my side gigs. And also, I feel like, you know, organization and and, uh, and really putting things together also kind of plays in with your work. You've got a lot of yes. little stories and things kind of going through it. And then, you know, I having done collections management and then also working with shippers all the time. I love you guys. You guys are my people. <laughs> we speak the same organizational language and yes. you know, being able to Tetris something into a, into a box truck is, uh, is an art safely okay. and, and well. Um, but uh, so the teaching portion, um, do you think uh, like, what has it been like working with students and, uh, and what has that meant to you? And, you know, why did you enjoy doing that part? Um, so leaving the university in 2018 um, and just focusing on the studio, I think all of that made things come back to me, meaning that um, students who went off into the world, who got jobs or who um, had something big in their life happen, all started to come back and send me emails, send me text messages. Like that whole trickle back to me has made um, me feel very excited about being an instructor, professor, and helping people find their direction and their goals in their life. So you don't get that when you're in the class. You don't get that when you're day to day in and out with students grading papers, doing studio visits, um, because it's like, no one has that moment of peace and time to think about all the things that happen. So I'm getting all the rewards now, which has been really awesome. 
So I feel like <laughs> I was good. I'm a good instructor, and I wouldn't think that if I didn't have the space and time for people to come back and tell me how awesome their life is because they took my drawing class and they learned how to draw with their feet, and now they're teaching their students how to draw with their feet <laughs> or draw with their mouth or the music that I listen to in my classes, they bring them into their classes and their students are like, oh my God, who is that band? And then they remember, oh yeah, William Downs was playing that when I was drawing his class. <laughs> I want to I want to add on to this um, a little bit because we, uh, we have that jury annual exhibition up that you jurred. And so there's 106 artworks for the people that haven't been in. There's 106 artworks of art students um, that were selected to be, or not only art students, it's students from all over campus who have taken an art class at UAB within the last year. And so they submit artwork. Um, William came down, I think in December and chose the artworks to go up in the exhibition. And so when we bring tours through there, um, we don't, just say, hey, go look at the artwork. I always try to make an activity. And I said, think about your year because group shows tend to be a great way to show um, what are we all kind of collectively going through. And, uh, and so I say, pick a theme as a group, go find an artwork that fits that theme. Um, and I'll also shout out Disney is one of the artists in the show. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, and so it's our chat monitor here tonight. Um, so uh, we, this last uh, tour I did um, for a class a couple of days ago, I had them come in, they, they pick artwork that they think fits their themes and uh, that describes their past year. And usually it's things like tired, um, lonely, uh, frustrated, things along that. Uh, theme and at the end of the whole tour we go through your exhibition Lily Sonia's and then this jury show and I say okay what was the word that you came in with uh and what word are you at like where are you at now having seen these exhibitions and I had one student say I came in tired and frustrated because you know school and and everything that's been going on in my life everything but after seeing that juried exhibition I feel understood because I'm not alone and so I think that when you were selecting that I know you were looking at the figure a little bit but you put together such a uh, a really great show that showed some amazing threads that don't always come out in these group shows so can you do you even remember uh, at this point like can you talk a little bit about your thought process and putting together that show? I do. Um, you know, I, it, it, um, it really touched me. Like I've been a juror for a lot of shows and I've seen so much art. We have a space here in Atlanta called day night projects. That's the space that I'm a co-director of. So I'm constantly seeing work and it's been my favorite thing in the whole art world. But when I, was invited to do the show, I was overwhelmed when I walked through the front door. And it wasn't because of the amount of work. It was because of the passion that was in that room. It was so intense. So I had to figure out if I were to write a song about this institution, what that song would sound like. So I had to figure out all the parts and the pieces to make that sound and to create the different levels and layers that made people feel a certain way. And I think I found it. And all the people that came up to me at the opening who were in the show, I had never met them before, but from looking at their work and connecting them to them, it made this beautiful self-portrait. And I thought, wow, I did a great job. I found people who had voices, who were talented, um, and, I wanted to cover the whole spectrum of all the things that we um, deal with in life and all the feelings that we possess. Um, I think the one piece that still sticks in my eye is the furry eyeball piece. Like that adventure was very beautiful and I, I love that. And then the, the one that we gave third place, the little miniature, like some people feel that way. And I love that she had the guts to put that in this big, show so i had to think about all those things and um i think um 
I still see a lot of those images, which means a lot because sometimes I don't remember certain people's works. But <laughs> um, so I was really excited, and I, I think I told Rich at the at the lecture that I was um, thankful, and I thanked him for bringing me to do this because there's so many great artists that I felt like the future art is going to be. Um, taken care of because these guys are really good and hopefully they keep moving into the art world because they're so talented. They I really are. I definitely, I, <laughs> I mean, I'm biased because I work here, but like, <laughs> I also, I genuinely think this, this program has been doing wonderful things and your selections and how you thought about it really, I just want you to know, did come through because this is a student from an environmental studies class that came in took this tour and we added this portion on at the end as to you know talk about UAB as an ecosystem and they got it they they saw what you were trying to do and yeah. then they and they really latched onto it which i think was um kind of a testament to how much you you think and put into it as um not just an artist but also as a juror um so i know we're almost out of time i have one last question. Um, so uh, how has the pandemic impacted your art? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, my friends and I always have this conversation about how artists who work all the time usually like being in isolation um, or like just being left alone to do their thing. So I feel like it made me dig a little bit deeper in my work. And as you see the work that you're looking at right now, that show at Mocha GA was kind of like the window that I needed to help me prolong and maintain my integrity in my work and to give it a responsibility and give me a place to, to, to push and develop during a time where we didn't know what was gonna happen. Like, I didn't know my show was gonna happen, but I had to keep working in my garage. But when they gave me the green light, but they told me that there was not gonna be an open reception, it was just gonna be me with the Zoom and talk to people through that. It hit me hard and I felt really sad because I wanted people to be surrounded by this 250 square foot wall drawing and let that be the backdrop that I would stand back and see all the humans surrounded by my humans, like being in a cave. And my friend Frederick would take a photograph of people in front of the work to give it more dimension. None of that happened. So I had to think about slowing things down because people had to take... Um, they have to make a re reservation to see the work and go in and experience it alone. So I got a lot of emails and text messages and Instagrams of friends who saw it. And there's like five of them in this big space. So I felt like it was a different way of experiencing the work. And it taught me to like slow it down a little bit and just accept how we have to reinvent ourselves as humans and how art can still maintain its integrity. But it's going to be seen and felt in a different way. That's amazing. That's probably one of the most um, like philosophical ways of thinking about the pandemic that I've heard. And that's so refreshing. <laughs> it's so refreshing to like hear something like that, that, Oh, you took it and you really leaned into it in a, and, and got something from it. Yes. Um, well, thank you, William. We are right at time. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed this. If you guys were working on something, a coloring sheet or not, uh, or, or some other project, uh, feel free to, I always like this part, show us what you did. This is what, I did mine earlier. If I'm talking, I can't, I can't do two things at once. But um, if when you signed up, you should have gotten a link for these coloring sheets. So work on them another time. If you do, Post them to Instagram, tag us at Ava UAB, um, and we'll post them onto uh, our Instagram. But William, 
Thank you so, so much. I learned a lot from this. Thank you. Uh, and for those that don't know or didn't hear earlier, the whistling that you've heard is the pet parrot that's been on the call. <laughs> um, she's wanted, she also really enjoyed the talk. So um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and everyone have a great night. And if you're in Alabama state or the Southeast, stay, stay safe or any of the snowstorm that's happening right now, stay safe.